Okay, so we're going to look at some of the social and artistic ideas that are arising in the uh, 19th century, at the turn of the century, as we move through the 1800s and this changing time frame through industrialization and things of that sort. So uh, first we have a few social and economic ideas we have to tackle, and then we'll move into the artistic. So one of the main ones that we're going to deal with is this concept known as liberalism. And we've talked about liberalism certainly before, but there are two major ideas in liberalism, and the main ideas are liberty and equality, and that is uh, this idea that individual freedoms should exist and people should have equal opportunity, and uh, that's what's demanded of classic liberals. They also insist on representative government, that is this idea that people should have a say in their government. It should not be a monarchy necessarily, but it should be some form of republican government where people have a say, they have a chance to voice their opinions. They push for equality before the laws, so there's not specific laws geared for specific people. So just because you're a nobleman doesn't mean you play by a different set of laws than a commoner. And they want to even get away with that distinction. And so that there's just one large uh, legal system that deals with everybody. And these early uh, liberals also demanded a few individual freedoms, and those are codified in many of the uh, words of the time. And so that includes freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom from random arrest. So you need to uh, be able to say what you want to say. You need to have an independent, uh, you need to have independent newspapers who can keep everyone else in line. You need to have the right to gather and protest. And then you need to uh, make sure that you're not just being arrested uh, for no reason at all. There needs to be justification uh, for why you're being arrested, not just random search and seizure. So it's, again, just providing this equality for all so that no singular person is above the law. Uh, next that we'll look at is an economic system known as laissez-faire, and this kind of tends to uh, go hand in hand with uh, Classic liberalism. Oftentimes, that's what we talk about uh, together as being a key component. And so, um, the unrestricted private enterprise is their key component. And that is uh, this idea that the government should not be involved in any way in the economy. The government should just let the economy uh, run on their own so that. Uh, it will sort itself out. And this idea, of course, is first proposed by Adam Smith with his invisible hand. And he argues that if the government just leaves the people alone the and leaves the economy alone, it will naturally figure itself out. And this, this invisible hand of the free market will guide it to a successful resolution that will be in the best interests of everybody. Uh, the problem is that initially, initially, uh, businessmen use this to justify their low wages, right? The government has no right to regulate me. The government has no right to be involved in private enterprise. So I can charge whatever I want. I can pay my, my workers whatever I want. And this becomes dangerous. Uh, and so eventually we see this disappear or challenged by the idea we'll look at uh, in a little bit. Another idea that pops up at this time is nationalism. So in the 1800s, nationalism really begins to take root. And we define nationalism as pride and loyalty uh, for one's own country. And... Uh, one's ethnicity, one's nationality, uh, and that's nationalism. And so what we see in the 1800s is European nationalists, and really it happens in the 1900s as well, and even in the 2000s, but European nationalists um, look to turn their perceived cultural groupings into actual political entities. So if we are all one ethnicity, let's truly turn ourselves into a nation state as it is, uh, rather than this random collection as being oppressed under a singular empire, let's push ourselves to be a true nation state. Um, and so this is dangerous for these empires that are collected with a number of different ethnicities within them because those ethnicities rise up and want their individual rights and uh, their ability to self-govern. Uh, one of the main reasons why this comes about during this time is because of the, the creation of these urban industrial cultures. And so you have all of these people from all over various countries gathering in cities and as they gather, they recognize that everyone in their country speaks the same language, has the same culture, celebrates the same holidays, eats the same food, 
And this creates then this massive nationwide culture rather than simply a regional culture. The other thing is that as they gather in these big cities, they need to figure out ways to communicate with each other. So they find common ground in a common language, and that then helps them develop even further uh, their cultural and national unity. Um, these nationalists are almost exclusively liberals and republicans. Uh, typically, conservatives are not that interested in not that interested in nationalism because it can remain a threat to their empires and it can remain a threat to the monarch who may be ruling over people who are not of the same ethnicity or culture of him or her. So they don't tend to like these ideas. Nationalism tends to be a more radical stepping stone, especially one that we see uh, in things like the French Revolution. So we've got that. Um, and their argument is that nations, just like people, have a right to exist in freedom and have a right to freedom and have a right to uh, their own governance. And so just as every person should be allowed to vote, every cultural group should be allowed to govern themselves instead of being governed by someone who is vastly different than them. And so that is their argument. One of the dangers of this nationalism is the creation of an us and they mentality. So we are the in-group, we are the culture that we like, we are the culture that is the best, we are the culture that should be, we should be proud of, and they become the enemy. And this is, of course, very dangerous because it can lead to uh, persecution, it can lead to expulsion, it can lead to various, uh, various problems within uh, a nation if you let this uh, us-they mentality really continue unchecked. Um, so that's nationalism. In response to the laissez-faire and uh, laissez-faire economic ideas that I talked about earlier, we see this new rise in an economic movement known as socialism. And socialism really begins in France, and a lot of that is inspired by the French revolutions, uh, and we'll be able to understand a little more of why that is in, in a minute here. Um, but the argument of socialism is that the government should control the economy in order to avoid the destructive competition of capitalism. So socialists would argue that this capitalism, instead of creating this uh, free market where everyone benefits, it rather creates a free market where people get destroyed. And it's worth noting that socialism is a sliding scale. So there are more extreme versions of socialism for certain people than others. Um, not everyone believes in this total government control, uh, but there's some varying degree in there. But in general, socialists believe that uh, the government should have some control of the economy in order to prevent this uh, destructive force that they call capitalism. They also believe that uh, private property should be regulated by government and the government should be involved in property control at some point. Um, so those three kind of key elements are uh, economic planning, greater economic equality, and state regulation of property. Those are the three kind of key hallmarks to uh, socialism as it's defined then and truly as it's even defined now. So uh, those are the key elements to socialism. And some of the major socialists at this time, there's a few of them, again it starts in France and it really finds most of its footing in France and becomes very popular there. Um, so one of them is uh, Count Henri de Saint-Simon and he is a uh, French socialist and he sees there as being two groups, and this is going to kind of be a, a theme as we move through some of these socialists. And uh, Saint-Simon argues that there are, uh, these two groups are the, the parasites, who are these old aristocrats, uh, judges, lawyers, clergy, these old, this old power, this old money. And he says that these are parasites. They are just sucking off uh, resources and valuable time and things from uh, the doers, who are scientists, engineers, and industrialists, who are pushing society forward while being dragged down by these parasites. And so Saint-Simon argues that the doers could plan and guide an economy that would be beneficial to all, and uh, that these uh, this economy would also include social institutions that should be aimed at improving the lives for the poor. And he argued that these old parasites were not actually doing that. They weren't doing anything to truly improve the lives for the poor. Instead, they were just, again, being parasitic and sucking off important resources uh, from what was necessary to improve society. Uh, other socialists, we have uh, Charles Fourier, who uh, is believing in a socialist utopia 
uh, and he is very critical of middle class family lives. He is early on is a big promoter of uh, women's equality, and he uses he uses math in order to kind of create this perfect utopian society. A little bit of a stranger person. Uh, some of these early French socialists believe in these utopian ideas that are a little bit out there and a little bit bizarre. Um, and, and Fourier is certainly one of them. Uh, Louis Blanc is another socialist, but he pushes for universal voting rights, which is really crucial and an important step and not, I mean, it's radical for the time, uh, but it's in keeping with the progress that had been moving. And so we see that socialists aren't always uh, against liberals or liberalism their economic theories certainly don't align but in terms of their social issues they do tend to line up in terms of expanded voting rights and sovereignty um, louis blanc though argues that the state should create uh, government backed factories and that every person had a right to work and a right to a job and decent wages and that is starkly different from uh, what liberals classic liberalism and laissez-faire economics would argue uh, but it's certainly what he is arguing. And then lastly, uh, we have Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who argues that um, there should be no ownership of private property. And he thinks that property is simply a way for the government to steal from the worker and what is the rights of the worker. And so this is the be kind of the beginning of socialism. Uh, these are important figures in the early French socialist movement, and they lay foundations for later, more even more radical uh, socialist movements like Marxism. And so uh, this is kind of, if you view socialism as an evolution, uh, Marxist socialism is kind of the pinnacle of its evolution. And so we have these two guys, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, who write uh, the Communist Manifesto in 1848. And in that, um, Engels tends to get left out pretty often. But Marx and Engels argue that... Uh, the interests of the middle class and the working class are opposed to each other uh, and they are they are irreconcilably irreconcilably opposed to each other that they're working for opposite purposes and he argues that throughout history he views history as a class struggle and that one class had always been exploiting the other and it had always been the middle and upper class that's exploiting the working class and so he argues that he's ready to um, defend the working class against this uh, upper class and so he calls this middle upper class um, the bourgeois and the working class of proletariat and Marx says that the modern industrial society had made this split that had existed throughout history all the more apparent uh, more apparent than it had ever been before and he predicted a future where the proletariat rose up in a violent revolution to overthrow the bourgeois and set up a more utopian society um, this socialist society and Marx believed that the proletariat would be aided by bourgeois who go over to their side. The reason he believes this is because he is one of those. Marx's father was a factory owner. Marx was a wealthy, uh, relatively wealthy and well-off young man, but sided with the workers in their fight. And so this violent overthrow is what Marx is predicting that all of history is building towards. All of history is a class conflict and it will eventually culminate in this violent revolution where the proletariat throw off their bourgeois overlords, if you will. Um, and Marx is really building off the footsteps of economists such as Dave Ricardo and his Iron Law of Wages. Um, and so he's arguing that as these wages go down, the proletariat, that working class, needs to fight back and they need the help in order to uh, earn a living wage that is acceptable, in order to create a society that is uh, just and fair for all. He also very much steals from the ideas of a German philosopher named George Hegel, who isn't necessarily terribly important other than to know he is kind of the precursor to uh, Karl Marx. So that is kind of the uh, economic and social ideas as they existed during this 1800s. And now we're going to look at some of the uh, artistic and literary ideas. And this time period is, ca is categorized as uh, Romanticism. And Romanticism, in many ways, is a revolt against uh, Classicism and the Enlightenment. Um, so in Classicism, um, there is like a lot of stiff, rigid like poses. There is this kind of like a desire for perfection, but in this very sterile way. And Romanticism is very much characterized by this emotional exuberance. It's full of love and passion and lots of imagination and lots of spontaneity and really just kind of embracing 
uh, very much the chaos. And they call themselves the Sturm und Drang, which is a German phrase meaning the storm and the wind. And so in this, it is this um, embrace of the chaos. They live life on the fringes of society. They reject materialism as a whole. Um, and they try to achieve their spiritual highs through art rather than through religion or other traditional means. And so you have very much, they, they very much are like the hippies of the era uh, in many, many ways. And so this is the group that lives on the fringes, but they do great things. And some of the famous figures are people that we still recognize and know today. Uh, some of the most famous po uh, writers uh, from this time, you have William Wordsworth, one of the greatest poets of all time. Alexander Dumas, who writes The Count of Monte Cristo. Victor Hugo, who writes The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You have the Brothers Grimm in Germany who are writing these fairy tales and collecting them in part of German nationalism. Uh, and they're working in this uh, romantic, idealized way that's full of exuberance and happiness and love and art for the way it is and the spontaneity and the chaos. And just embracing that rather than trying to make order. You'll recall that the Enlightenment was all about applying the scientific method to human society to come to rational conclusions and romanticists throw that out the window. And they argue that in many ways you can't have logic and you can't have rationalism, but rather we should embrace the chaos and the spontaneity and not try to solve every problem by applying the scientific method to humans. Some of the major, and the really the major uh, advances in this time, in this artistic era, is in writing and music more so than in painting. So whereas maybe in the past painting had been kind of the a uh, mechanism for which we viewed major artistic movements, and this time it is in writing and in music. And so uh, the, there are important painters, Joseph Turner and Eugene Delacroix, are important and meaningful, but they, are not, they don't stand out as much as previous uh, artistic eras do. But in terms of music, this is very much the height of, uh, of great music. You have people like Beethoven and Chopin and Liszt who are playing, and I don't know that there's anyone who more embodies uh, this spontaneity of uh, of romanticism more than Frederick Liszt. And Liszt, in, in his music, he strives to create a sound that no one has ever heard before. He strives to create this, this cacophony of noise that makes people uncomfortable in a way that leaves them wanting more. And so he ends up with this chaotic... Uh, period and it is it ends up getting a term called listomania where people literally are going crazy for lists music because when they hear it it's such a different sound that they're not sure how they're supposed to perceive it and so it makes people very much uncomfortable and so they swarm to hear this sound to try to understand and they're unable to process because it is so different people eventually come to love it but it takes them a long time to reach that point and so we, what we have in this romantic era is this passion and the spontaneity and this exuberance, this kind of whirlwind of emotion that's happening at the same time. And our art, artists are trying to find ways to express that and to kind of pull that in and show it through their art.